You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Hey there. Did you know Kroger always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Kroger app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Kroger today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. You, you feel this, this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You gotta make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank caller. Prank caller. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Packernet After Dark. This is the call in show of the Packernet Podcast Network. If you'd like to call in, if you'd like to participate in the show, please feel free to do so. The phone number here is 608 501 0718. New callers go directly to the front of the line. We don't have any new callers today, so let's just get started. Hey, Ryan. How's it been since the game? I haven't Good. called since then, so I don't know how you're doing. Um, but anyways, hope you're doing well. Uh, so I'm just calling because um, it's this week that we've got coming up, this mini buy, as they call it, because it's like a little bit, it's from Thursday to Monday and uh-huh. then followed by the regular buy. I think this is absolute perfect timing. Because that's gonna, we're gonna have seen pretty much everything: the highs of this team, from to the lows of the team, to the mediocrity of the team. Um, so we can go into this bye week and the mini buy and everything, and use it as a time to evaluate, like what works, what doesn't work, what do we need to grow on, what do we need to keep with, keep up with. Um, and so I think it's good that there, because five weeks is a good sample size of what you have um but it's not the time to be freaking out because we knew this was an evaluation year so let it be an evaluation year let the good things happen let the bad things out see what we need to do see what we need in order to grow um but just most importantly don't panic don't freak out don't be like oh my gosh we need to go get new players we need to go do this it's like no this is a young team. This is what we were planning on. So don't get mad when things, in the same way that you can't get super overly excited when things go great, you can't get super down when things are going bad. Because when you're young, like for example, right, when you're a kid, you don't know that you shouldn't put your hand on the stove until you put your hand on the stove. That's how you learn, by getting hurt, by getting beaten down, by getting broken. Like you, That's how you learn, especially in this situation. So if anything, use this as an opportunity to grow together and whatever. Um, and But the one thing is, is that it's like if, it, if the defense still doesn't perform by like week eight or week nine, I think that's when it's time to – get a new defensive coordinator just to see what can happen Uh, because if he's clearly not the answer find someone who is before it's too late Um, but I'm coming up on a train here and I'm like right next to it so I'm going to say goodbye so it's not too loud for you bye thank you um, yeah, as far as the bye week goes, um, you know, last year after the bye week is when we kind of figured some stuff out. It shouldn't have to be that way every single time, but, you know, hopefully that'll give Joe Barry a little bit of time to do what he did last year and figure out some changes that need to be made. Um, that also could include some of the extra pieces like Eric Stokes or Peace. I don't know if there's anybody else. Hopefully we get Devondre back and whatnot, but... Um, 
So that'll be a benefit. Hopefully we can handle the Raiders and go out on a high note and then, you know, get another bye, come back, beat another easy team, hopefully pretty handily because now we're like a new and improved Green Bay Packers. We're healthy and we have, you know, learned some stuff. You know, because if you think about it, to some degree, you come into this season with a plan based on stuff we don't know. We don't know what we have and don't have and how people are going to perform and act and everything else. And the, the bio will give us a little bit more time. I mean, we, we kind of have had a lot of time here, so maybe we'll see a little bit against the Raiders. Um, but then again, coming out of this by hopefully a better plan moving forward with the p pieces that we have. Um, so handle the Broncos. Uh, hopefully can handle the Vikings, although I expect that to be tough. Should be able to beat the Rams. Hopefully Steelers have been a disaster. Chargers are beatable. Lions in Detroit, I have no real reason to believe we'll win that, but, you know, we'll see. Chiefs should be a loss. Giants should be a win. Buccaneers are winnable. Panthers should be a win. Vikings, again, will be tough. And Bears should be a win. I mean, that, even if the team isn't great, if they're healthy and can improve in some areas and don't implode, we've got, what, three, four, five... Six, seven, eight, nine games that there's no excuse to, I mean, nine wins feels kind of like the floor. And that's with not including the Vikings, the Chargers, the obviously the Lions, the Chiefs, the Buccaneers, the Vikings, I think I said. So there's other winnable games in that mix. Right, If we just take the two that we have, plus the seven Raiders, Broncos, Rams, Steelers, uh, Giants, and Panthers, that's six, right? So that's actually eight, I think. Whatever. Um, it feels like eight is kind of the floor, I guess. But yeah, you're, you're, you're also right about the, you know, like we've said about the evaluation. Here, here's, here's another way to look at it, because I've, I've talked about it a hundred times. Got to try to find different ways to say the same thing. The goal is to be that team that we were back in the mid-20 teens, right? When it was the Packers are the favorites to win the Super Bowl. We didn't, but we were the favorites to win the Super Bowl, right? 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. We were one of the top, if not the top. I think probably 2015-ish is when things started to peter out. Maybe at the start of 2015 we were. After that, it maybe started to chill out a little bit. But that's what we want. So... Who's going to help us get there? Who is a part of that? That's what we're going to find out, right? Who's the guy? Aaron Jones, probably not, just based on his timeline. Dylan, probably not. Jordan, he hasn't proved that. He can be, but he hasn't proven that he's that guy. Um, Zach Tom, I believe, is a part of that. Elton Jenkins, I believe, is a part of that. We'll see on the other three guys. I'm guessing not Rashid. I know everyone's really excited about him. I'm just skeptical. So far, he's been good, but I'm skeptical. Um, I see him kind of as a Yash, but maybe he's, you know, going to be a, a solid tackle for the future. I have no idea. We'll see on, on Myers and Runyon. Um, defensively, Kenny, I don't know. I don't know what his timeline necessarily looks like. Uh, Wyatt, I hope so. I mean, he's, he's proving to be a really good pass rusher, which is flying under the radar, but he is he is one of the top defensive tackle pass rushers in football right now. Um, and Brooks and Wooden, don't know. We'll see. Rashawn, 100,000%. Preston, don't know. Depends, I guess, kind of on his timeline and, and whatnot and, and the Packers' timeline to actually get to that level. Uh, Jair, yes. Razul, I don't know. Stokes, I don't know. Keyshawn, yes, but not as a corner. And then the safeties, probably not. Now, that isn't, you know, again, the standard isn't perfection. You can have some guys that are decent or medium. But in terms of, like, we need guys that are on that level, who do we have that's that's going to help us to get to that level? Not that many right now. Now, it's mostly I don't know, we'll see, because it's a very young football team. But the whole point is, it's just sit back and show me something. Show me that you're that dude. Which wide receiver is going to be the next Devontae? And if, it, if the answer is nobody, then we're not done finding a wide receiver. 
You know, because if if Dobbs is like our best receiver, let's just say Dobbs is our best receiver and he's like a you know, 72, 75 overall PFF guy. And then you got Watson who's, you know, pretty good, but I you know, I mean, the the point is you want to have an elite guy somewhere. Somebody's got to be that dude. And if nobody's going to be that dude, then it's, you know, Dobbs can be the number two and Watson can be the the speed guy on the outside. And, you know, Jay, I mean, we can have four wide receivers and just kind of rotate them out with that one elite guy, I guess. I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with having good wide receivers, but who's going to be the Devontae? And, and yes, I do want a premier quarterback. And if that's Jordan, great, but he's got to step into that. I'm not going to just crown him because he hasn't been abysmal (laughs) and because he's made a couple nice throws like everybody in history has done. So yeah, this is just prove it time. You know, as much as yes, you want to enjoy this year, you want to win these games. uh, You you don't want people making fun of the Packers or you on social media. You want to be good now. You wanted to get into the playoffs now, even though I don't think anybody necessarily expects a Super Bowl. You still want some level of success. The real goal here is this is this is an individual thing. It's a team sport, and I want them to be a team, and the locker room needs to be. But but at the end of the day, I'm looking for individuals that are Super Bowl caliber individuals. And right now, I'm looking at, you know, like maybe two offensive linemen, Jair and Rashawn, pretty much, <laughs> with maybe some some potential in there. Someone's got to just step up and be a monster, man. I don't mind. Again, I don't mind good football players, but somebody's got to be a freaking beast. And not just a pass rushing beast that's a horrific run defender slash tackler. You know, if you're Christian Watson, you can't just be a deep threat. It, they're young. I'm not. I'm not root, uh, ruling anybody out. Like I said, the only person I'm, I think I'm out on is Royce. Everybody else, they've got the potential. They're. They're. I'm. I'm right here. I'm. I'm ready. I'm willing. I'm patiently waiting. But that's what we're all patiently waiting for. Somebody's got to step up to the plate and show that they are that dude. That, that I'm 100% confident you don't need to be either replaced or somebody put in front of you, All right? Because like Romeo Dobbs, I like him, and I am confident he will be the wide receiver here for a long time. But I'm not necessarily confident he's the number one. He can be, but right now he is like a top-tier number two wide receiver. So that's what we wait for, and we just wait for superstars to emerge. You know, or Quay, I think I forgot the linebackers. Quay is, is a part of that equation. Do we know he's the dude? I mean... I think he'll be here for a long time, but is he going to be a great player or is he just going to be a dude that's pretty good that plays linebacker? I don't know. We'll find out. Ryan again. Uh, or Aaron again. Hey, Aaron. What's up, Ryan? It is Aaron again. Anyways, um, so it's October now, which is known as spooky month because of Halloween and whatnot. Okay. Um, so I guess that gives me a question because we haven't talked about horror movies in a while there because football season is going on. So, have you seen any good horror films in the, uh, lately? Um, a I good have. Question. Um, there's a really good horror film um, called The Chicago Bears um, <laughs> that they 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 gave up a big comeback, and then they have to play on a short week against a team that just barely lost to the Cowboys. So. The commanders are going to be fired up to just demolish the Bears. Um, and so yeah, that's as close to a real-life horror film as you could possibly get. <laughs> so um, I, I, I just the Bears, I, I guess it's like they're produced by uh, A24 or Blumhouse or something this season um, and every season, really. Uh, but, yeah, have you seen any good horror films lately? There's a few out right now that look pretty decent. So, yeah. Bye. Um, I think the last one I saw, and I, I believe I mentioned it on here, uh, it's a good line, by the way, with the Bears, gave me an idea for um, something that would be hilarious, is to create, like, a movie trailer for a horror movie this Halloween, and it's just, like, the Bears 2023 season lowlights. <laughs> Or highlights. It's the same. It's the same uh, video. But uh, I saw that that Exorcist thing. That so there's a there's a new Exorcist I think coming out, which I kind of want to check out just because I like the original Exorcist. I'm sure the new ones aren't going to be as good, but um, there's the one they keep showing the trailer for with the girl walking into the church, body in the blood or whatever. I don't know. But check it out. 
But then there was the one that had Russell Crowe in it. I think that was the last horror movie I saw. But you're right, it is October. I'm, I'm guessing some stuff is going to be coming out. So I should, uh, I should probably jump on the old Netflix and see what they got. Let me check right now, actually, see if anything seems interesting. You know what I saw recently? There, I've seen a couple... I've been watching, uh, not like recently, recently, but Netflix has got... Oops, sorry, they're playing previews. Um, they've got a bunch of... Uh, movies that I've been checking out like they got a bunch of old movies that are like classics that I just have not seen and I just I've watched like four of them so now I can say that I've seen them like um Heat was one of them what the heck else was there uh Donnie Brasco I saw The Devil's Own which was actually pretty good I don't think that's like a big uh like I'd never heard of it before but it was a good movie oh uh Legends of the Fall I just I I saw that and thought of The Office so I knew it was kind of like a chick flick, but I was like, it kind of seems interesting, and there's some big names, so I checked it out. It was a decent movie. The Pope's Exorcist, that's what it was. I see that there. I watched The Jerk for the 700th time, because I have to every time I see it. Uh, the Outlaws was actually a really good movie. And then the one that I just watched, like, two days ago that I really enjoyed, I think it's new-ish? I don't know, but it's called uh, Reptile. Yeah, 2023. Benicio Del Toro, Justin Timberlake. It's a good movie. I liked it. Anyways, horror movies. Kind of surprised they're not pumping them out yet. I'm looking at their new stuff and they don't have horror movies. They're behind the eight ball here. I don't know. I'll have to look around a little bit and see what I can find if there's anything new that's interesting. I see they got a list of scary movies here, but I don't see anything that's new. So, suggestions, let me know. Sorry, in my last call I said the Commanders barely lost to the Cowboys. No, but they barely lost to the Eagles. I knew I was wrong. Um, So, yeah. So, But anyways, the Commanders are going to be very fired up to kill the Chicago Bears. So, okay, bye. Well, I want to say fingers crossed, but, I mean, again, I really would, wouldn't mind. I, I, if the Bears are going to lose, part of me kind of wants Justin Fields to play well. But then there's also that fear of, like, if he plays another game well, it's like, well, crap, is he actually getting good at football? Because like, that would suck. I don't want him to be good at football. So I don't know, man. I mean, I... I Rick. Whatever. It is what it is. <laughs> we'll see. If they lose, I'll be happy. If they win, then it's like, oh, good. And they figure something out. But they're probably going to get their skulls caved in because they suck at football, and that's just the way it goes. Um, Tell you what, we don't have a ton of other calls, so why don't we take a break right here, and we'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. What's up? This is Omar Fasada. How you doing? I'm on some uh, cheap Bluetooth headphones right now from Amazon, so I don't know how good y'all can hear me. (laughs) But I'm going to try to go over um, a top free agent list. Um, I looked it up, so I'm just going to put some of the names here. You can let me know if they're going to be available if they're having a good year or a bad year. Uh, this is a wish list. I don't really see us doing this, but number two is T. Higgins. I I want us to have a receiver more, maybe to add a receiver with speed in the draft. Um, and T. Higgins is not really a speed threat, but, you know, they're saying he'll be a top 15 wide receiver. 
Um, but this is this is where I start on my want to get. So you got Antoine Winfield Jr. from Tampa Bay. Mm-hmm. Safety, um, we can sign him, you know, solidify the safety position. Uh, he was ranked number 14th. Uh, you got Jonathan Taylor, obviously, number 17th. You pick him up. Um, not overpaying running backs. Uh, as far as cornerbacks, number 18th is Christian Fulton from Tennessee Titans. You say he's above average cornerback and he's young, so I'm assuming that's a positive. Uh, another person I like is Kyle Duggar from the New England Patriots. He has safety, and they say he does everything, and he uh, makes big plays. So I could definitely see us maybe signing those two as safety, and then we'll have to worry about it. I don't know how deep the safeties are in the draft, so let us know that. Uh, Josh Jacobs, I really like Josh Jacobs. You can get him cheaper than Taylor. And I think if he, you know, got some good blocking, he can do his thing uh, from the Raiders. Then here's another key guy. This is the guy I really want. All right. So it's the New England Patriots. Mike, I don't know how to say his name, Mike on Winu or something. I don't know his name, but he's a top five guard, according to PFF, the last two seasons. I don't know about this year. And the Patriots are going to give him a big contract, so we could do that and solidify the guard position once and for all. Um, Leonard Williams is an older guy from New York Giants, but, you know, helping on, D, on the D-line. Uh, Carolina Panthers safety, Jeremy Chin. You can look him up, maybe get like a cheap deal, you know, kind of do the same thing like we did uh, a couple years ago. Um, Zach Smee, Felix, I don't know how to say this, Zach Sealer, I don't know, from Miami Dolphins, D lineman. Again, I really want us to address, uh, to address the D line. And last, before I get cut off, is Justin Mubaku or something like that. Baltimore Ravens defensive tackle. That should be a good pickup. And speed receiver, Marquez Brown. That's on the comments. I'll call back to the rest. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I could have paused those as we went and looked up each individual one. Um, the, the cool things about these these lists is there are a lot of big names that are free agents next year. The, the negative is 90% of them are going to be signed back to their original team. That the The benefit, though, is that some of them are actually going to slip through the cracks. Like each one individually you look at and say, there's no way they're not going to get paid by their team. And you're going to be right most of the time, but some of these guys are actually not going to get paid. And I have heard about T Higgins as a potential, I think for various different reasons, uh, partially I'm guessing because of Jamar Chase and his cost. Um, I don't know if that's a real thing, but T Higgins is, is legit. And if we end up getting T Higgins at the backside of this, after all the talk about missing out on T Higgins and all that, it sure would be pretty uh, poetic. I'm sure the people mad about it still wouldn't be satisfied because we missed a Super Bowl apparently because of T Higgins by not having him. But yeah, some of these guys are actually going to end up not getting paid. They're not going to make it back to their teams. And, and these are, these are the guys that early on in the process of free agency, like those two days before free agency even starts, you hear about these trades that are unofficially official. That's when usually these big name guys go. And so it'll be interesting to see how involved in that the Packers are going to be. Obviously, we're going to start having more and more money as we move forward, getting away from some of these bad contracts, getting away from the Rodgers thing and moving off of Bakhtiari and that kind of stuff. Although there's going to be other ones that take the place, um, it still should be a much healthier cap as we move forward. So we'll see. We'll see. And, and, and again, this is part of the whole process of finding out what it is officially we don't have, right? We, we As we figure, you know, like you mentioned, Jeremy Chin. I mean, I you talk to Panthers fans, he is the greatest safety that has ever existed. PFF, meh. His overall grades, 59-71, 55-70. So up and down between subpar and good. He's had He's given up nine touchdowns, had two interceptions and 14 pass breakups. 106.3 passer rating when targeted. Just a 66 tackling grade this year, which is his second highest. So run defense is 63, which is his highest ever. So he's not much of a run defender, mid-tackler. Generally, his whole thing is coverage, but he's very up and down. Like even even this year, it was 65, 83, 44, 86. So would I want to give the bag to Jeremy Chin? Probably not uh, so much. Well, the Packers, maybe. I don't know. Maybe they'd want to give it to him. Who knows their evaluation process? But uh, let's get to more of your list, and we can kind of go through, and then I'll, for fun, grab a safety out of college. Not named 
Cooper DeGene, if we're even calling him a safety. I don't know. Who cares? All right. What do you got? I, I tried to hurry up and say it by name before I got cut off, but um, didn't do it. But anyway, Marcus Brown, I reason I said him because he has the speed. Yep. And um, so I don't know how his grade, look at how he's doing this year, but it's, I feel like if he sucks, it could be because they don't have a good quarterback. But if you add him and, uh, you know, fast receivers we got on our team, I think he'll be pretty good, do a pretty good job for us, and we can get him probably cheaper and not spend a lot of money. Somebody else on that list? I would guess we wouldn't go Hollywood Brown, um, largely because we already have Christian Watson. And then, um, you know, I think Hollywood Brown is just a speed threat, and he's not super good at that. Now, you could, again, you look at Miami where there's just speed across the board. I'm sure there are benefits to it. But I just think that would be low on the uh, list of priorities if I had to guess, but I don't know. This would be Curtis Samuels. Yeah. But uh, Commanders, he also has speed and, you know, could have him compete to him, Dobbs. You know, compete for the number one spot. Uh, see what happens. Um, more defensive line help. We're going to like the yeah. Curtis Samuel is uh, he's been pretty decent. He's actually older than I. Well, no, he's he's just twenty seven, but he's been in the league for seven years. Uh, so he was young when he came in. His grades have been consistently okay. Um, since he's been in Washington, sixty six, seventy, and seventy. Um, he had 655 yards in 2022 so far this year, 178 and no touchdowns, but yeah, 5'11", 195 and runs a 4'3", So this dude is stupid fast. Um, and I think he's more of a middle of the field guy too. He's not like a down the, down the field. He's a slot guy. So he's a blazing fast slot guy. Now, again, we have a slot guy. Are we going to replace DJ Reed? Is he in addition to DJ Reed? Is he just going to be... We got this four wide receiver group that we're kind of playing with and different things. Or when we go four wide, we got, you know, whatever. I don't know. But um, it's just it just gets a little bit jumbled because I think you lose a little bit. You know, you, you add Curtis Samuel, but then you take away also from that, which could be somewhat less incentive to do something like that, you know, because I don't know that he's much of an upgrade. He's faster. But just looking at his quality, I don't know that you get much more. But I don't know. Low quality free agents, but might can help make him into something. Will be a DJ Reader, from Cincinnati Bengals defensive tackle. Just to help with that, and then a safety from the New York Giants. Hold up. All right, DJ Reader. Um, gotta switch back to defense. I wish it would just do that automatically. So DJ Reader is 29. Um, he has been a very good defensive tackle over the years, but you wonder if he's kind of starting to take a step back. Granted, the whole Bengals team is falling apart right now. Uh, just in 2022, he had an 85 PFF grade, 71 run defense, 84 pass rush. Now that was abnormally high, and it was really just 32 pressures on 310 attempts. So at best, he's a 10% guy. But he's 6'3", 335. He's primarily a run defender. His tackling has been bad since 2018. Um, well, since 2019. It hasn't been good since 2018. I would be skeptical. Um, I could see why you'd bring him in, but it just it feels like one of those fool's gold things where it's like he's a big name that was really good, but he's 29. He's kind of seemingly on the downswing. His grade so far this year, 73, 70, 68, 59. Like it's just it's going down, and at this rate... It's going to be a pretty low... I mean, 29 is not that old, but you're going to get him at 30, and you're probably going to have him for maybe a couple years. I don't know. I would be a little iffy on it, although even if he takes a step back, he's probably still our best run defender. So if it's not a huge pile of money, which it probably wouldn't be because he's, again, just a run defending... mostly just a run defending guy, it might be worth looking at, but I would just I would just worry about him being on the on the downswing too much. Xavier McKinley, um, they're saying he, he he did a pretty good job until he got like a new defensive coordinator and then he fell off. So it's just some names, just you know to to check through, see if you think that'd be a good pickup or a bad pickup. You know you're always looking for it. I'm I'm gonna look towards the draft. I'm gonna wait probably till after the halfway mark and kind of see what positions. But I really think. 
you know, like you said, drafting a player, you're only probably going to get maybe two starters in the draft. Yeah. If you're lucky, like quality starters. So we need to get some free agents to help. And um, I really think if we can add some of these names, you fill, that, you fill it in. I don't know about really getting a running back per se. I guess that would be only if we let Jones go. Like if you can get, you know, Josh Jacobs or Taylor for the same price you pay Aaron Jones, even though I love Aaron Jones, it's kind of like, hmm, because just, you know, they can kind of do it all. I feel like you got to keep Jones on the pitch count. That's my only thing I don't like about Jones. But other than yeah. that, if you can draft a running back, in uh third round, fourth round, fifth round, and just pairing with Jones, I'd be good with that as well because running back is a very easy, easy position. But that guard from the Patriots, man, I'm telling you, I think we need to go after him hard. And uh one of the safeties that I mentioned. So just let me know what you think. What, or, you know, this was from August. This is from the beginning of the year because uh, obviously they had, like, Nick Bosa number one. So some of these people might have already been signed, but just, just something for you to check on. All right, go back, though. So uh, Xavier McKinney, who you mentioned, um, he's somewhat intriguing, partially because he's 25 years old, so he'd be 26. So that's kind of in that, right in that range of just coming off your rookie contract. You get them when they're still young; they still have that second contract to go. You know, they're still kind of in their prime. Um, the last, well, I shouldn't even say the last two years. 2022 wasn't great. 2023 isn't off to the best start in the world, but he did have a good first and second year. He's always been a really good tackler, aside from, I guess, this year he's struggling, but it's only four-game sample size. Um, but his first two years, he had a 70 and a 75 grade. Last year, it dropped off to a 61, and so far it's a 66. Um, trying to identify what he does best is kind of tough. If you just look at the first two years, I guess you would lean coverage uh, with being kind of mediocre run defense, but just elite tackling, which might not be the worst thing in the world for the Packers and what they're looking for. I mean, stability in terms of coverage, in other words, just not bad at it. Run defense, same thing, just not being bad at it, but just also a really, really sound tackler. But it'll be interesting to see how he continues this year, because if he ends this year, kind of like how he did last year, then he's probably not a great pickup. He had a 58 run defense grade last year and a 58 coverage grade, but he was a 2020 second round pick uh out of alabama so he's a talented guy that has put it on display it's just a question of you know is something wrong can we get the the good xavier mckinney back or what and then you mentioned mentioned uh the guard out of new england um he is really really struggling this year but he is a solid football player traditionally and he's also very versatile so as a rookie so he's a rookie in 2020 he was a sixth round pick out of michigan he played left guard, right guard, and primarily right tackle as a rookie sixth round pick out of Michigan. He had an 84 grade, 85 run blocking, 72 pass blocking. So he, he does lean better run blocking than pass blocking, although 2022 was different. 2023 is a disaster right now. I don't know why. 2021, he primarily played left guard, but he also played two snaps at right guard and 276 at right tackle. He had an 87 overall grade. 89.4 run blocking grade, just freaking elite monster. By the way, he's 6'3", 350. Dude is a beast with a 70 uh, pass blocking grade. He gave up 11 pressures that season. Um, just for reference, Royce gave up nine in two games. He gave up 11 all year, two sacks. 2022 is a little different. He took a step back. He played in t the entire season at right guard. Took a step back. 79 grade, still dominant, but an 83 pass blocking grade, 73 run blocking grade. He would still be one of our best offensive linemen with that grade. Like, better pass blocker than John Runyon, and by a mile, a better run blocker than anybody else. This year, however, he has a 44 PFF grade, 53 run blocking, 51 pass blocking. He's given up four pressures already in three games. Now, he did miss week one, so I don't know if he's dealing with some kind of an injury. Maybe that's kind of a setback, but... If this guy is what he was 2020 through 2022, and if for some stupid reason the, the New England Patriots decide to not pay the man or let him test the market or whatever, I'm on board uh, a thousand percent because he can pass block and he is an elite run blocker. 
like maybe let's go back to 2022 I wouldn't be surprised if he was the number one run blocking guard in football or at least had to be top five actually let me go back to 2021 that's when he was elite run blocker yeah he was he was number three behind Joel Batonio and Zach Martin for the Dallas Cowboys with an 89.4 run blocking grade Crazy, crazy, crazy. And the uh, highest run blocking grade in Green Bay that same year. Um, boy, I am scrolling here. John Runyon, who ranked 68th with a 57 run blocking grade, which is pretty standard for the Packers. So yeah, that's it's somebody to keep an eye on for sure. Again, I would assume if he can get back to himself, they're, they're going to pay him to stay a thousand percent. But... Um, if not, yeah, I'm I'm 100% interested in that. All right, let's take our final break and uh, see if we can actually get caught up on calls for once. That'd be great. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Good on, man. It's Carson from Cleveland, Ohio. What's and up? you know what I think? What? I think we should take our third-round pick that we always pick bad uh, in the third round. I think we should take that pick and take Joe Barry and ship both of them off to New York for their defensive coordinator and maybe Sauce Gardner. He could sure. come too. Uh, and maybe Quinn and Williams as well. But I think we should do that because um, Joe Barry sucks. We can't pick him <laughs> the third round. So we might as well ship him off to a defense that uh, is good right now and make our defense uh, better. Yeah. Um, because if we mm-hmm. don't and we lose to the Raiders and we our defense plays bad, then I might cry. And I don't think Joe Barry wants to see me cry. And he if he does, then he's a psycho. And <laughs> do we really want a psycho running our defense? Probably not. So all signs are pointing to the departure of Joe Barry. Um, Sound logic. So yeah, I don't. I don't know if you could trade coaches, but if you can, um, ship them. So yeah, that's all I got to say. Go pack, go. We're gonna win on Monday, um, and we're going to win by twenty three points. So yeah, goodbye. Very well said. I appreciate everything you've done for society. Um, <laughs> I, I really don't have anything to add. However, I did I did remember that I forgot. Um, I was going to pick out a safety in college. So the number one safety right now is Malachi Starks via PFF at Georgia. So that's someone to keep an eye on. However, I don't believe he's draft eligible. I think he is uh, currently a sophomore, so he's got one more year to go. But he has a 91.9 PFF grade, an 88 run defense grade, a 90 tackling grade, and a 91 coverage grade. (laughs) He's pretty much elite at every single thing. The only thing he hasn't dominated at this point is pass rush. But he has uh, 17 tackles so far, zero missed tackles, 11 stops, which is more than he had all of last year with eight which is insanity. He's been targeted 14 times. Only five of those have been caught for 33 yards. One touchdown against him. Two picks, four pass breakups, 28.6 passer rating when targeted. So that dude's a freak. The second highest is Jalen Simpson at Auburn. But that's a bit of an anomaly. He's actually been in college for a long time. This is year five. He's having a bit of a breakout. But it's like elite game, bad game elite game bad game elite game which maybe that's fine i don't know but the guys he's his grade 65 61 67 71 and then this insanity um he does have four interceptions <laughs> this year though in five games so i i'm not in on that uh 6 178 not a great football player but he's just getting a ton of picks after that we've got uh dominic deluca penn state Actually had a 99.3 grade against Delaware. That's one of the higher grades I've ever seen, a 97.8 coverage grade. Um, I don't see him as a potential draft target, but he has been pretty incredible. He is listed as a strong safety slash slot cornerback. PFF is being stupid, so I can't see what his previous years have done. He was decent last year, too, I guess. I don't know. But anyways, then you have Jerron Morris at FAU, Trey Taylor Air Force, Dell Pettis at Troy, uh, two Minnesota guys, Tyler Newbin and Jack Henderson, and then Elijah Clark at Syracuse and Kalen Bullock at USC. Those are the top 10 PFF graded safeties in college football. If you're looking for coverage, Jalen Simpson is a top guy. Run defense, Dominic DeLuca, followed by 
uh, actually two Penn State guys. You got Dominic DeLuca, number one, and Kevin Winston Jr. as the number two guy. Sean Preston, Mississippi State. Terry Jones, Dominion. And then Urshad Davis at Troy. As far as the consensus big board, um, the only one on this list that is that I, well, actually, there's a couple that I listed here. Um, Cooper DeGene, not on the list. I don't know if they list him as a safety, though. Cameron Kitchens was not listed. Javon Bullard was not listed, but Kalen Bullock, safety out of USC, would be the one guy that is expected to be really high that is also doing very well. The other one is uh, Minnesota safety Tyler Newbin. So a couple guys to keep an eye on. But yeah, Newbin, <laughs> Newbin has three picks already. Three picks and a pass breakup. 8.3 passer rating when target is, is what he has right now at a 89 coverage grade. 58 run defense, 74 tackling. 6'2", 2'10". Kalen Bullock is 6'3", 190. He has an 88.9 coverage grade, 57 run defense, 66 tackling, basically three elite tackling grades, two horrific tackling grades, but four pass breakups, one interception, one touchdown, 41.9 passer rating when targeted. Both of them are off to a great start. Of course, if you have any further questions about these guys, you can direct them to Jake Shavink, who is our draft guy. I'll have to ask him about those guys, too. Brian, what's up? It's Bryce from Escanaba. What's up? I just wanted to touch base on uh, the offensive line struggles. Last year, um, the Vikings game, before the Lions game, the offensive line had probably the best performance I have ever seen. Okay? Then, fast forward to the Lions game, win and get into the playoffs. Literally the worst offensive line performance I have ever seen. Yeah. Something needs to be done. Yeah, we have, and, and that is a common thing, you know. And I and I think that partially plays into why Rogers got a bad rap as far as him falling apart in critical games. Because in a lot of those times that I remember him falling apart, the offensive line played like crap. So, yeah, I, I that is certainly a thing with this constant freaking implosion. Good offensive lineman, um, but when it comes down to crunch time. They typically fold. No, or the Lions. Um, so I'd say get rid of above a few of them and start drafting some uh, some guys in the earlier rounds. Um, we just need more consistency. That's the biggest thing. All right, take care. Go pack. Go. Well, yeah, and two points, and and this doesn't negate anything you said, but I want to bring it up. I'll bring it up on tomorrow's podcast as well. But I, I saw it, and it's worth noting. Um, if I can freaking find where I put it, I... Sh- oh, here we go. Um, quarterbacks, so Scott Barrett posted a thing, which is um, pressures compared to expected, and Jordan Love is number one. So he is like negative 10% when you look at his pressures compared to what is expected. 10% less than expected. That is to say his his offensive line is overperforming expectations more than anybody else arguably the number one offensive line if you wanted to use this metric so just for everybody that is like throwing the offensive line under the bus just so we're clear and i believe this is through all four weeks still number one offensive line but as to your specific point here's what i think we should do i i I don't like the idea of just get rid of them here's what we should do though we should invest we should be drafting it, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be round one or whatever. But listen, these guys have versatility. John Runyon can technically play tackle. He can technically maybe play center. Maybe Josh Myers can play guard. I don't know. But if we go out and draft first round tackles, second round guards or centers or whatever, if we're investing in this and even getting some free agents, I'm not necessarily getting rid of anybody. You you can fight for your job. Runyon, if, if we got a guy that's going to play right guard and he's probably going to beat you out, you could look at left guard. Well, Elton's there. Well, maybe he'll play tackle. Or maybe you can fight uh, Josh Myers for the center job. The point is, we're going to load up and we're going to try to get better. And if you win the job, great. If you don't, honestly, even better. Because we're better than what we were when we had you and you were pretty good. So I am I, I am against the idea that this is a terrible offensive line just wholesale. Although, again, you make a good argument about collapsing and imploding at very inopportune times. Which I don't know what the remedy is for that. I really don't, because if that's a team thing or a culture thing or a coaching thing, then different players aren't necessarily going to fix that. Again, why would all five implode at the same time? That doesn't make sense. Seems to me there was potentially some schematic things there that 
Detroit was exploiting that need to get fixed. Which, now we got to look at our offensive line coach and say, what the heck are you doing? Because it's possible we have more than enough talent that's being improperly utilized. Occasionally can be manipulated and, and those kinds of things. But I am, am I in favor? Pretty much at every position, I'm okay with drafting elite players and just letting them battle it out and see who wins and who loses. It's not just places we have deficiencies. I mean, I'm, I'm opposed to like a first round linebacker or something, but drafting linebackers, of course. Running backs, yes. Offensive line from left to right, yes. Quarterbacks, potentially, yeah. I mean, if we have a top five pick, am I opposed to going for a quarterback? Not really. I mean, if Jordan balls out, then yeah, go get like an elite wide receiver or tackle or something. Am I opposed to competition, to finding out, you know, which one of you is going to rise to the occasion and be the elite person at the most important position in football? Nah. No, th- there's nobody that's sacred. There's really nobody that's sacred. And, and for the ones that are sacred, they're not going to lose their job. You know, it's kind of like that thing with, with Aaron Rodgers, where it's like, what are you worried about? You, if, if you are the same Aaron Rodgers you've been, you're not going to lose your job. And he didn't until he wasn't, and then he lost his job. You draft Lucas Van Ness, Rashawn Ingram loses his job. It's just going to make everybody else better. Or he's going to replace people and be better than, you know, maybe Preston, maybe this guy, maybe that guy, whatever. But th- there's no negative to just getting elite players and just putting them on your team. So, yeah, go get some offensive linemen. How's it going, Ryan, and uh, the rest of the netters out there, all yep. of us listening? Um, Steve up in Alaska, for those who don't recognize the voice, but I'm a uh, I know you're going. To, most of you're going to think I'm crazy, but I'm happy to say that today we've gotten our first real significant snow. Um, it's not very much; it's only like shut up. Uh, don't talk to me about an inch snow. Or so, but it's it's snow that is down and it's sticking and it's kind of hanging out. It'll probably be gone tomorrow or the next day. Everybody in the in the Midwest or the snow areas, they know those kinds of snows. That first one that lets you know that season is upon you, mm. even though it'll go away and you won't get any real snow probably for another month. But there it is. Uh, and I know, sounds crazy, but I do love the winters up here, and I'm looking forward to it. It's quiet. All the all the tourists and the mess and the craziness is gone. But on to the business at hand, that's talking about the Packers. Um, Ryan, I'd uh, I'd like to to make a point here from what my point of view is and what I've seen and listened to. Um, I think you are misunderstanding a good many of the people who are calling in and talking about the defensive – or not the defensive, the offensive line um, – I hope this isn't too late behind everything, but I think everybody's, from my opinion, what I hear and what I personally said myself is not talking about what we're going to do for this year and how we're going to fix this year. It's what we're going to do going into the future because, as we've talked about and you yourself have said, this is the first step of a long road, all right, not specifically in those terms, but that's what this is. This is the year where we figure out where we are and what we're going to be for the coming future for the Green Bay Packers. And I think a big part of that is that we need to get this offensive line as an offensive line that's going to be one that's going to stick around for years to come. And what, regardless of what the numbers have said, because we saw it at the end of last year, we had issues and questions with it. You brought it up yourself because I remember the shows talking about it in the uh, off season, well, we're getting ready for this season, what the team was going to be, and there was questions about how we were going to line everybody up. And though we started well, we have been flagging, and then we fell off a cliff. Um, so we'll see what this next week is, but I think the real thing that everybody's talking about is where we're going with the offensive line, because it's the core of what we do. Yeah, but all of this, my point, Steve, all of this is based on one game. And this one game is like, so we went from like the best offensive line to the worst offensive line. And the question is, did we just overnight become the worst pass blocking offensive line, despite being maybe the best pass blocking offensive line for several years with the same guys? Myers and Runyon have been very good pass blockers. Zach Tom, very good. You know, I mean, there, there's borderline, I would, you could call it hypocrisy in the fact that I think people have hated Myers for a long time and they're using this as an excuse to get rid of Myers. But yet, those same people, pretty much everybody, nobody, will want to talk about Zach Tom, who gave up the most pressures, more than than Royce Newman did. Does anybody want to get rid of Zach Tom? Why not? Why not? He gave up six pressures in a single game. Bakhtiari sometimes wouldn't give up six pressures in a season. 
He gave up six pressures in a game. Should we get rid of him or not? If not, it's because you understand what I've been saying. You're just choosing not to understand because you want Myers gone, because you wanted Myers gone since last year, and because you don't really like Runyon either. And you've been saying for a long time that you don't like them and they're not good enough, refusing to believe that they've actually been very good pass blockers and are using this one week as a reason to get rid of two guys that you wanted gone all along. When really this entire discussion is irrational. There will not be another week like this. That's a sweeping claim that may not come true, but I mean, this, this is a... Th- th- I, I don't know if the Packers offensive line has ever been this bad before. I'm, I'm including games against like Tampa and San Francisco where you had some bad offensive linemen do some bad things. The amount of pressures given up in this game are like historic. It's freaking unbelievable. And so yes, I, I understand the future. And the point is, if, if we throw that game out, Josh Myers is a very young player. John Runyon is a very young player. Zach Tom is a very young player. Elton Jenkins is a very young player. Those four guys are there, and we just need a left tackle. I get that nobody agrees with that. Nobody chooses to acknowledge what I've been saying, which is that they're very good pass blockers and has just been waiting and waiting and waiting for this one day where they can say that, see, they're not good pass blockers so they can throw out every other good game, throw them out with it, throw out the baby with the bathwater, baby Myers and baby Runyon, just get rid of them because we hate them, and then just cross our fingers that we're going to find some elite pass blocking and run blocking player, which there's like two or three of them in the entire NFL. We're going to find two of them, one for center and one for guard, on top of Elton Jenkins, which is an incredibly rare find. And we're just going to be an even better offensive line. Like we were, we were like the number one, two, or three offensive line already. Now we're going to be like the number one, one, one A. It's like going to be an A plus plus offensive line. And again, I get that the the offensive line falls off. Again, my standard is how often does that happen to other teams? I don't have the answer to that question. Is this relatively common? Does that happen to most teams once or twice a year? If it does, then there's no reason to expect we can go draft somebody and it's going to fix that. And even still, even if this is rare, there's still no reason a draft pick is going to fix that. Because it wasn't a player thing. It's an entire offensive line thing. I don't think five guys just suddenly play poorly out of nowhere. This is a our offensive line coach scheme plan compared to their defensive line coach scheme plan got absolutely whooped. Or possibly our offensive linemen were out drinking until three o'clock in the morning or something, which I don't think a new player is going to fix that either unless he chooses not to participate. I mean, I'm making stuff up, but I'm just saying what happened against the Lions cannot be fixed by just replacing guys especially just and again it's it's only the guys that we haven't liked this whole time and we don't want to talk about the other guys that failed we don't want to talk about Rashid Walker he's solid we don't want to talk about Zach Tom they also had terrible games we just want to talk about the interior guys who we've been trying to get rid of this entire time that's why I don't buy it I think this is just Josh Myers haters finding another reason to hate Josh Myers and try to get rid of him and John Runyon haters to find another reason to hate John Runyon to get rid of him And so I'm saying the same thing over and over again. Throw this game out. Throw this game out. Throw this game out. It doesn't mean anything. You cannot use this game as evidence for anything because this is such an unbelievable anomaly. It would be like if Devontae Adams had a a 43 PFF grade and we're like, well, we got to get rid of this guy. Like, what are you talking about? No, you don't. And if anybody's thinking John Running is not Devontae Adams, please just smack yourself in the face. It's not the point. It's, 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 It's an exaggeration of a larger point. That everybody understands, but is choosing not to understand. This is not who Runyon is. This is not who Myers is. Yes, he sucks at run. Listen, if you want to say Josh Myers is a good pass blocker that sucks at run blocking, and I just am tired of his run blocking, and I want someone that can run block, and hopefully he doesn't suck at pass blocking, fine, just say that. But don't say we know that Myers and Runyon are bad pass blockers, despite no evidence, but this one game they were bad, and so I'm going to choose to believe that that's what they've always been, and now I want them gone. Now that's silliness. This is just, it's just silliness, and I'm, I'm just, I'm getting exhausted with the conversation because it's just, it's a nonsensical conversation. You want better run blockers? Fine. Just say you want a better run blocker, but understand you're very likely going to get a worse pass blocker. The vast majority of offensive linemen kind of suck. Most offensive linemen are not as good a pass blockers as Runyon or Myers, and there's a better chance of going backwards than going forwards. And many of the people, I mean, look at look at the center in Minnesota. That dude blows. He was a mid first round pick. The guy's garbage. Josh Myers is way better than he is. I get. I'm I'm exhausted watching him fall all over himself, run blocking all the time. I get that. I really am tired of it too. But my number one concern right now is our uh, offensive line coach, 
and the fact that guys that we know are good are not playing up to their own standards and they're not able to communicate and they're not able to identify where pressures are coming from. And I don't want to throw out good players and restock more good players in hopes that the offensive line coach isn't going to mess this one up. That's not, that's not my number one thing because, again, that's the hard way to do things. To tear down and rebuild an offensive line is an unbelievably difficult thing. Right, And I know we all think that the Packers are some kind of super geniuses when it comes to offensive line, and they can just close their eyes and point to people, and magically they become superstars. But I'm not trusting that that's going to happen. They might be able to hit on one or two or whatever. You know, you get a couple guys, great, that are decent, maybe. But better than Runyon and Myers right now? Understanding that those are two guys that we drafted, so assuming that we're just going to be better than what we did, because the Packers are always better, except for the time when they drafted those two guys. Doesn't make any sense. They also drafted Royce in the fourth round. So it's not a 100% hit rate. Um, I mean, you want to get rid of Runyon and Myers and draft two more Royces? Because that might happen. So, I don't know. I just... I feel like I've made this point clear. But I, I, I guess maybe I'm not making the point clear enough. It's what the Green Bay Packers are built around. We have talent, we have a quarterback, and we have a great offensive line. Um, I think we do need to focus a little bit more on the run. This this. Just pass, 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 protect. That's, that's something that's got to change because I think the league's going to start phasing back towards the run some. Um, but my time is about up, and I don't want to call in a second time and ramble on. So go pack, and let's go out and kick the crap out some lot, or the Raiders. All right, let's go. I, hope we lost. I mean, that would be another point to make in terms of wanting better run blockers is Matt LaFleur seems very invested in it. But yet, we're not as a team very... Like, we want to go out and get offensive line, or running backs, like, really bad. That seems to be a really high priority. That makes no sense if you're not going to invest in better run blocking. No sense whatsoever. Now, we don't have anybody on this offensive line that can run block. Like, we've seen Elton do it a little bit. We've seen Bakhtiari do it a little bit. But Bakhtiari, I don't think is... We're going to see him again. Um... So, I mean, you, you got to figure it out, man. If this is going to be a core part of what you do is running the ball, then you have to invest in it. Running, I mean, you have to be smart enough as a freaking coach to know that a major part of the production from running the ball is not the running back, it's the offensive line. You have to be smart enough to know that. And so why would you invest so much money and so many resources into a running back, but then not invest in the offensive line. It, 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 it makes absolutely no sense. You're buying a freaking Ferrari and putting a Tercel engine in it. I feel like this is the second time I've used Tercel <laughs> in an example. But that's what you're doing. What's the point? You're spending money on something that looks flashy but isn't able to actually generate what it should be able to generate because you don't have the offensive line. So either teach them better or, like I said, listen... Go out and draft. Go out and go go out and I mean, if you can get a really high price guy like the 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 Patriots guy who is a really good pat, a run blocker, and you think you can continue to get him in pat, like great, do it, do it. Otherwise, keep drafting. But you you gotta you gotta talk to Gutekunst and be like, look, we we need somebody that can run block. <laughs> like I know we 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 are really good at finding these like high quality pass blocking guys, these absolute technicians. But if we get another guy that just cannot run block, I don't know. I don't mean. I don't know what to do here. We don't have to run the ball well. I mean, we could be the Chiefs, but Matt LaFleur doesn't seem to want to go that route. He really wants to invest in running backs and, and, and in the run game. So fine, then we got to figure something out here. We got to get tight ends and not just the, the elite receiving type. We got to get offensive line that can run block at least a little bit. It's the most incompetent run blocking line ever. So I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's sort of an identity crisis in a way. I mean, the, the Packers' general idea identity has been pass-blocking offensive lines, elite quarterbacks, and good wide receivers, right? That's it. Not necessarily running backs, definitely not tight ends. That's it. That's the formula. You want to switch to having a more balanced attack and, you know, running the ball and then running play action off of that and all this kind of misdirection stuff and everything. I mean, that's that's awesome, but we kind of have to rebuild our identity a little bit and how we do things and if we're not going to do that then we're just we're we're not we're not building the right way we're building in two different directions that make no sense so i will acknowledge that much for sure hey ryan um so Hi. all this taylor swift talk is 
<laughs> kind of reminded me that I needed to call in um, because I live in Minnesota, right? Okay. And a lot of my friends and people I work with and everything are pe- Viking, not Packers fans, Viking fans. Yep. So most of them have pretty much given up on the season. That's most of them couldn't care less about Taylor Swift mm-hmm. or T Swizzy, as I call her, T um, because of the song with T Pain. But anyway, <laughs> okay. Most of them really don't care. However, they've given up on the Vikings to the point where they're just like, oh, yeah, Taylor Swift might be at the game on Sunday because she said that she likes U.S. Bank Stadium. So that's what they have to look forward to. Yikes. So is that Taylor Swift might be at the game. So talk. All, we can talk all the crap about Taylor Swift and the media can bring up Taylor Swift all they want. But that's actually what Vikings fans that I know, not all of them maybe, the Vikings fans that I know are actually excited. They're like, okay, I might watch the game just to see if Taylor Swift's there. You're excited that one of the biggest musicians in the world is going to show up and cheer against you? That's awesome. Way to go, dude. But I hope not, so they can be even more disappointed. But anyways, <laughs> um, have a good day. Well, I mean, that's... Yeah, she's going to be up there cheering every time Travis Kelsey scores a touchdown in your garbage defense. I, I mean, I guess if you want to be excited about that... You could be. I can't imagine that being a positive thing unless you are a big Taylor Swift fan and you're going to go there and you're going to get a seat and hope that you can see Taylor Swift and be excited that you're, oh my goodness, I'm within 150 yards of Taylor Swift. This is the greatest moment of my life. I, I don't I don't know, man. I, I have a very strong aversion to like person worship. You know what I mean? Like being that obsessed with another human being is kind of sad and pathetic to me. And, um, so I, I don't really respect that very much. I think it's, well, it's, it's sad and it's pathetic is, is what it is. So I, I don't know. I mean, if that's how you want to live your life in worship of other people, then go for it. But it's freaking weird and it's stupid. If you like her music, that's cool. But, you know, leave it at that, maybe. I don't know. Whatever. Anyways, that's it. We're officially caught up, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, if we don't get calls, uh, then we may not have another show, which is fine. You want to give me the day off? I'll take a day. I'll take a freaking day off all day. But, you know, I'm just letting you know we are out of calls. So you guys have a good rest of your day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.